Convening of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item, I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones uh, as they may affect the broadcasting system. However, committee members may use tablets for uh, the business of the meeting. Uh, we have received apologies from Dave Thompson and welcome Christian Allard to the meeting in his place. Good morning, Christian. Uh, I think you've been here before at the committee? First time. So do you have any uh, interest to declare? Um, not really. I don't think so. I worked in the fishing industry for a long time, but not anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, subordinate legislation agenda item one. Uh, this item is to consider three negative instruments today. Um, the Little Loch Broom Scallop Several Order 2015, SSI 2015-28. Uh, Loch U, Isle of U, Wester Ross Scallop Several Fishery Order 2015, SSI uh, 2015 slash 30 and the Common Agriculture Policy Direct Payments etc Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-58. Um, members have comments about these. Uh, there's going to be some comments I believe about a third of these but I'd just like to say uh, regarding the several orders regarding hand dive scallops that I very much welcome uh, these uh, orders being uh, continued for another period. They're in my constituency. They're a part of sustainable fishing, which uh, is to be encouraged. And several orders have proved in many cases to work well. Uh, it is in sharp contrast to the potential loss of livelihood of a large area of the inner sound not far away, which some of the fishermen from these lochs actually use. And uh, I think that uh, the government's approach in Scotland to this has proved uh, to be promoting sustainable fishery, not the opposite. Does anyone have any other comments about the scallop uh, issues? No? Uh, then the Common Agriculture Policy. Alec Ferguson? Um, yes, thank you. I would like to raise an issue about this. Members will have received yesterday uh, an email from uh, NFUS drawing attention to what appears to be a disparity in wording between the government's basic payment scheme greening booklet um, and the, uh, the actual wording of Regulation 5A of the statutory instrument. Without wanting to go into too much detail, what the, 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 the government's um, advice in its booklet is eminently sensible and in line with normal farming practice of under sowing catch crops with grass seed. Um, but it does appear that the wording in the regulation itself is much more prescriptive in, in that it brings the, um, the, the types of grass down to two specific types of grass seed that can be under sown rather than the sensible advice of the government which includes them in a mixture of grass seeds as is normal. Um, and I, I understand, having spoken to clerks about this, that we have some time and I wondered whether the committee might agree through yourself, convener, to write to the minister um, seek some clarification on what might be done here, uh, and then we can reconsider it when we've received that advice. Well, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I just wanted to speak in support of Alex Ferguson's point, and uh, NFU, um, S, as we know, have, have written to all the committee. And I do think it's an important issue to be dealt with, um, not least because um, some farmers, I understand, have already bought seed for, for this year, and it's just something I wanted to highlight about the importance. <laughs> Well, I think we thank the NFU for their uh, watch on this matter. Uh, we would have time in which to do so. Uh, can I suggest then we write to the government and get this brought back for a meeting on the 18th of March? Are we agreed? Yes. Agreed. Thank you very much. Let's move on then to the next item, which is uh, agenda item two, the Wild Fisheries Review uh, Panel Final Report. And uh, this is our second item in the agenda to take evidence on the Scottish Government's Wild Fisheries Review Panel final report uh, from the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. So good morning, uh, Aileen, and uh, welcome your uh, officials, uh, Willie Cowan and uh, Carol Barker Munro. Uh, I wonder if you have any opening statement that you wish to make. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning uh, to the committee. Can I just start by um, thanking the committee for inviting me to give evidence this morning on the Wild Fisheries Review. I came into post after...
the independent panel submitted their report, so I am uh, very much playing catch-up uh, with the committee, given your long-standing interest in and knowledge of this issue. The historical perspective is interesting and particularly relevant on this matter. Over the last 50 years, there have been a series of reports into the governance structures of salmon and freshwater fisheries. Despite the volume of considerations and the degree of consistency in terms of the actions recommended, there has been little in the way of strategic and holistic reform of structures. Now, we are embarking on a challenging and difficult task. The existing legislation is complex. Views are sometimes polarised and held strongly, reasons enough why others have elected to retain the status quo. But we are doing the right thing in tackling an issue that has been put aside too many times. So I plan to consult this spring on the broad policy options for a new management structure, followed by further consultation on a draft bill by the end of the parliamentary session. And I strongly believe that we can work together across the sector and across political parties to design and deliver a new wild fisheries management system for Scotland that is truly fit for purpose in the 21st century. And as the committee has noted in its earlier evidence sessions, the panel's report is thorough and wide-ranging. It contains over 50 recommendations for change, which effectively means a fundamental redesign of the management framework for wild fisheries. So in that context, I am particularly keen to hear the committee's views on the report. I have followed your earlier uh, evidence sessions and acknowledge that there is considerable detail that needs to be worked up in order to map out how any new structure uh, might work. That is inevitable in a reform project as large and complex as this. However, in advance of that detail, it is helpful to consider the broad management principles and themes that run through the report and those which should also characterise the management framework, maximising the value of any of Scotland's natural assets. Now, Scotland's wild fisheries are, uh, wild fish resources are undeniably such an asset. We need a management framework in place which seeks to conserve them and to harness the potential that they have to deliver social and economic benefits to the whole of the country. Decision making on the basis of evidence, which on occasion might be incomplete, must be embedded firmly within that framework and it has to enable us uh, to account for how we are delivering our obligations and commitments to those in the international community and at home. And I hope that we can all agree on that. I am absolutely clear, convener, that we need reform, but I'm also clear that in progressing change, we must not lose the best elements of the current arrangements. You have heard and noted that the sector is characterised by considerable voluntary effort and knowledge at a local level. There are many examples of excellent fishery management taking place in parts of the country. And in taking forward the next stages of the process, I want to ensure that we harness uh, these good elements and bring them into the design of the new management system. So I very much welcome this inquiry and hearing uh, the committee's thoughts on the review report. They are extremely valuable uh, for me as I consider the next steps in the reform process. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, how does the government plan to take forward the review's proposals for a national unit uh, with responsibility for fisheries management? Um, can I sort of say at the outset, just what I've kind of said in my opening remarks, that you know, given I'll also be consulting um, this spring on the broad policy options for a new uh, management structure. So I hope the, um, the committee will understand uh, this morning when I say that you know, I'm not able today in advance of our consultation to take a position uh, on the detail around specific uh, recommendations because we will be consulting obviously on the roles and functions of any uh, national unit which will be a, you know, very much a key part of that consultation. But we do need to ensure that the balance um, is right between a national strategic overview and local 
delivery, you know, what is absolutely crucial in designing any new management framework is that there is an alignment of accountability with responsibility throughout the system. Do you think that the review has established the right balance between the national accountability and local empowerment? Well, I think the forthcoming, I think the forthcoming consultation will certainly um, will seek uh, views on the respective roles and functions at a national and at a local level. And I'm aware that there are a range of views about who should do what. And obviously, you know, I look forward to exploring uh, this key issue in the months to come. Thank you. A supplementary from Graham Day. I thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. I, I just wonder, bearing in mind that there has been a history in some parts of the country of conflict between netsmen and boards, boards and government at the time, uh, whether taking the, in taking this forward you'll bear in mind that we want to perhaps get to a place where whatever new structures are put in place will help reduce uh, conflict of that nature in future. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a, that's a very uh, helpful question. I think the, I think the proposed um, national strategy would certainly would set out the clear roles and responsibilities throughout the uh, throughout the system, but some of the conflicts referred to, they're not maybe necessarily as a result of the structures, but however, a plan-led approach uh, and the clear understanding of such roles uh, and responsibilities may help to reduce such conflicts. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on with uh, a question from Jim Hume. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, yes, there's a controversial part of, of the proposals of the review, and that's um, changing the, the current levying uh, contributions and re possibly reallocating according to national priorities. Obviously, that could cause some concerns in areas like the Tweed, for example, where uh, there's some large uh, levies and their levies could go to elsewhere. A Andrew Thin said that that would not be a, a major movement of funds. It would be interesting to know what sort of percentage you thought would be able to uh, be moved from one area to another. Also, um, is there any scope for legal challenges from um, some of the riparian owners uh, to that uh, part of the to, uh, part of the review proposal? Well, obviously, I am interested in managing a national resource, um, and therefore, it is important to ensure. Um, that resources are available for um, consistent local delivery uh, of the national strategy. You know, this is about having our fisheries management organisations of a sufficient scale to deliver um, against these national priorities and the allocation of the resources um, available within the system to achieve that. Obviously, funding is always a challenging issue, particularly uh, in the current um, financial um, climate. But if there is to be an element of distribution, then I think it should be on the basis of best value for money and agreed priorities for uh, fishery management. I mean, you asked about whether redistribution might lead to a legal challenge. I mean, we are talking about a fundamental change to the management structures for wild fisheries and a new legislative framework for that system. So a number of district boards that cover uh, several rivers and therefore the principle of pulling resources, uh, priorita um, pulling resources, prioritisation and cross-subsidising, albeit at a smaller scale, uh, is already established. Um, I, th I thank the Minister for that. Um, but still concerned about what could be seen as centralisation, obviously, if the ultimate control will be, uh, as you say, with probably with yourself and there'll be an element of distribution. It would be interesting to see how much uh, of an element that would be. You say it's a national priorities, but then the, the Andrew Thin said it wouldn't be a major part. So there's slightly a conflict in what Andrew Thin's saying and yourself, I think. Well, I think if the, if the committee, I mean, if you have any particular sort of ideas or suggestions around that, I mean, obviously, as I say, at the moment, the very fact that what we are looking at are the broad principles of a new management structure. So, you know, I'm very keen to to hear, you know, any ideas or, or opinions that the committee might have around that particular issue. And perhaps, believe, what would you like to add in? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I think Andrew Thin's report um, is predicated perhaps um, for the first time in, in, in having an actual national strategy for the management of this protected species. 
well, protected species in relation to salmon, but also the management of fisheries in the round and maximising the um, social and economic environmental benefits of fisheries of that natural asset. I think one of the, the propositions in the report is that the, um, the, through the national unit, the, the minister would establish a national strategy supported by, by a research strategy. And the FMOs, um, if this was to take in, be taken forward, as the report suggests, FMOs would outline how their local management initiatives would contribute to the national objectives. So it's within that framework of building up what happens at the local level through into, into a national programme of work to achieve consistency and, and well, both protection of species where that's necessary and maximising the value of a natural asset for the people of Scotland. So to the extent to which redistribution is necessary I suppose it depends on what the final framework looks like. And as the Minister said, um, that is go we're, we're going to be coming out to consultation on that in, in more detail um, quite shortly. OK, thanks. Thanks, Convener. Thanks. Um, Sarah Boyack and then Graham Day. Thank you very much, Convener. It's really a question to follow on about the issue about redistribution and about the issue of the impact on the successful rivers. Um, because the suggestion is that there's enough money in the system that you could spread that money elsewhere, target protected stocks in other areas. Um, are you envisaging pump priming from central government? I mean, one of the issues we've got suggested um, in evidence by the Tea District Salmon Fisheries Board is that they have concerns that if their money is taken away somewhere else, it limits their capacity to restock their fisheries. And we've had that from other areas, and that they would suggest that they would then have to get more voluntary top-up monies locally. And it's just how this will actually work. Have we got um, sets of figures in terms of what the financial gap is that you estimate we have on the rivers that are vulnerable and are not being properly restocked? I think the, 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 um, the issue of restocking is, is one which polarises opinion also. So some rivers do restock as a matter of course, um, but um, advice from various um, fishery bodies suggests that restocking might not be the best way forward. So it, it's an issue to consider. But in, in the round, I think, as the Minister said earlier, the, the, the principle of redistribution or, or working collectively between boards and rivers already is there. It happens between uh, board, neighbouring boards and neighbouring trusts who have common interests. So the principle is already established. And the proposition in, in the review report um, is that there should be, for various um, reasons, not least economies of scale, there should be a smaller number of management organisations who look after a larger area. And it's when what, what we would need to understand, <coughs> excuse me, when the detailed propositions come forward, is what those areas look like, and therefore what are the resources available within those new areas. And then you can figure out whether, at a national level, there's a need for redistribution and what that might be. But do we have figures that underpin what's coming in at the moment in different areas and what the, the, what the sense is of what's needed in the areas, whether it's management issues, um, on the ground, what it is that's missing that needs to be targeted? I think the issue just now is that the, the, there is no national oversight of the management of fisheries. Fishery boards are, the, are, the respons are responsible for managing fisheries in their own river. So the, the proposition here is that we take that upper level to the strategic level, then we have a national oversight of the management of fisheries as a whole. So we're not replacing like for like here. We're talking about a complete redesign of the system. And on the back of that, we'll, we'll need to figure out how the, how the resources that are available within the system and any other resources um, might be necessary and, and how, they, how they can be achieved. Yeah, Minister, I wonder if you would accept that there might be an argument under the proposal for reallocation of the levy to compensate rivers that have been negatively impacted upon by activity elsewhere. For example, netting in a mixed stock fishery which sees fish taken that were destined to return to their native rivers. I think the, um, 
the the issue of mixed stock fisheries is is oh, sorry, the issue of managing mixed stock fisheries is, is twofold. In, in a general sense, it needs to form part of the national strategy. But specifically, excuse me, um, the minister's already out to consultation on one of the recommendations in the review report, which is for a kill licence. And the basis of that kill licence is, well, on, on the one hand, as it suggests, it's, it's, to, it's to manage the number of fish taken from rivers um, or, or from coastal fisheries. But the purpose of, man, of, the, the purpose of managing that resource is to ensure that sufficient fish are going up the river in order to restock to, to conservation limits. So the, um, the, the management, sorry, the, the implementation of the kill licence, um, once, we've, once the consultation is finished and we've got final proposals, I think the, the implementation of the kill licence will effectively answer that point because where the fisheries will only be licensed to take fish where there is a where there's an evidence harvestable surplus. So I think the kill licence, if, if, if a net fishery cannot demonstrate that, that there's a harvestable surplus for the fisheries it impacts upon, then it may not be possible to licence such a fishery. But, but if I make you know, how would you be able to determine what element of the fish that were being taken at that point actually belong to that the river nearby and what element it was perhaps headed for three or four other rivers. So when we're talking about harvestable stock, how are you going to actually measure that? I think we've um, we've got some work undertaken by our, our science colleagues at Pitt Lockery which which um, have tracked some fisheries and we we we're we can demonstrate that in some areas um, Fish, fish from certain certain um, netting stations are impact. Oh, sorry, the, the taking of fish from certain netting stations can impact on on multiple rivers up and down our coast. But the um, this is again this is part of the, the detail that, that we are working on. And as the minister said earlier, none of this is easy, and it's never been done before. Mm. I like Fergus. I if I could just draw, uh, draw, draw you out on a point that's already been made. I can absolutely understand the desire to have a national oversight of, of wild fisheries management and, and policy. Um, but I think, I think it's already been hinted at that, that each river is different, has a life of its own, um, and therefore one, one has to bring individual river management down to a very local level. Uh, I find it very difficult to see how this is all going to work without having further insight into the size and shape of the local management organisations. Um, but I wonder if you can give us an assurance that, that the eventual structure will still be flexible enough to allow the, the, the very considerable local input that I believe is necessary for a river-by-river -river management policy within that national oversight, within that national structure. Um, yes, I can give you that reassurance. I mean, we have said that we are, you know, clear that we, you know, we have to retain um, the best parts of the current um, arrangements, and you know, that also um, is in relation to, you know, like our local knowledge um, as well. So, you know, I think as I said um, before, we need to make sure that we've got the right balance there between the national strategic. Uh, overview uh, and you know local delivery as well and obviously you know that's something that we're very keen to kind of work with the with the committee around in terms of how we get that structure right okay thank you uh, on a similar point uh, but uh, raising money uh, Claudia Beamish thank you convener and good morning minister uh, could we we take this um, into the the region of the um, introduction of rod licenses, which, um, as, as you'll know, Minister, um, the review's pr proposal was that the government should consider introducing these. Um, and I wonder if you could um, say what the government's response would be at this stage uh, to that. And very importantly, um, has the government made any assessment of how the rod license, uh, how much it would raise in relation to the cost of administration? And I have got a further question, but I'll leave that until... 
Um, I mean, the report um, does say that there is enough money in the system to pay for um, fishery management, but that restructuring uh, is necessary to maximise the value for money. Now, beyond this, uh, as uh, Claudia Beamish quite rightly points out, the report recommends consideration of the potential for a rod licence to raise uh, revenue to develop um, angling opportunities. And you know, I'm aware that you've heard um, evidence from you know others on this issue, and that in common with many other issues, the views um, differed considerably. So I would be extremely interested <laughs> to hear the committee's um, views around um, a lot, the road licence. I mean, the road licence, I mean, they haven't been included in the proposed um, removal of the exemptions for some sporting activities by the Land Reform Bill on the grounds that the whole issue of funding for fishery uh, management is being considered um, as part of, obviously, the, the Wild Fisheries um, Review. But in terms of whether the government's made any assessment of how much a road licence um, would raise, um, the answer to that is no, because this hasn't been um, government policy. But should there be any support for this recommendation to be taken forward through both with the sector and with the committee, then of course that we would be very happy to uh, investigate this further. Thank you. And uh, the um, rod licences as such. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. And then and, we'll and Mike the, Russell after. Thank you. Uh, and the, um, as the minister will know, the Scottish um, Federation of Course Anglers is in support of the, um, the introduction of rod licences and. Um, we, we had some evidence in committee about the importance of um, the fishing traditions going on to the next generation and the opportunities for access to fishing and, and, and information for, fishery, uh, for fisheries. Um, would you agree, Minister, that there should only be a rod licence if an Angling for All programme is developed in tandem with it? And do you have any comments about involving young people and, and making access um, easier for um, residents and for tourists? Well, again, if I can say to the member that obviously um, today we're very much kind of discussing around the kind of the general kind of broad principles for a new management structure. So, you know, I'm ahead of any consultation. So I'm very keen to sort of to hear the committee's views around, you know, the sort of the introduction of a road licence um, as well as, you know, the sector as well. But, you know, I think in terms of our young people and opening up the access to angling, you know, I'm very aware of a number of projects that are in place to encourage more young people um, into fishing and which are doing um, some, good, some very good work. I mean, we have the, the salmon in, in, in the classroom. But I think it's how, you know, how we actually um, move that forward. You know, I, I'm conscious that the Wild Fishers of you actually concluded that the third sector was probably um, the best way of um, driving uh, the initiative and that the government would be there to catalyse, facilitate um, and, you know, and support. But obviously, you know, we are managing for a purpose and we're trying to make sure that we can maximise the benefits for the people of Scotland in terms of our, our socio-economic and making sure that and we are delivering benefits for the people of Scotland in terms of the economy, for our social cohesion, for access, where there is, you know, potentially a lot there that the sector can do. Right, thank you. Uh, Mike Russell. I think the, the argument from the review was that it was unlikely at a time of financial constraint, or perhaps unlikely ever, that the government would have a resource to invest in the development of uh, the sport, essentially, um, and that the review panel also felt that Scotland was underfished. And those two things coming together suggested to the panel that a rod licence might provide the resource both to develop the sport and also to make sure that the fishery was more sustainable. If the rod licences were not to come about, what resource would the government bring to the table to achieve those objectives? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm not going to comment on resources because... If the answer is because, none, which well, I suspect it is. Uh, I suspect that Mr Swinney would want to speak to me if I pre-committed the government's resources. I think it, it comes back to the, this is a, the, the, the proposition is for a fundamental reform of the whole management system based on a national strategy. And we need to understand what that national strategy would look like, what the structures beneath it would look like, what the split of roles and responsibilities would look like, and how the, the changing in the, in the structures would 
would alter the amount of resource available within the, the, the new fishery management organisations. And once you've got to once you've got all of that in place, then we'll be able to figure out if there is a gap in funding, and if there is a gap in funding, how best that, that might be achieved. But I think in, until we've been through the, the consultation and the process and brought forward specific proposals for a new management system, I, th I think it, it's difficult to, to estimate what, what any financial gap might be. I, I'm, not, I'm not postulating this from my own knowledge. I have very little knowledge. The, 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 the people who are postulating this are the Wild Fisheries Review. And it was a review team that argued in their report that there should be uh, at least a consideration of a rod licence, and I repeat, because the resource would not be available to invest in the future of the sport. Now, if that is true, and I mean, you know, I think the, the Wild, Fisheries, Wild Fisheries Review has been well received in terms of the quality of its information, then I do think the issue is quite crucial if there is to be no resource to invest in the, the sport and the, and the development of the sport, uh, then either the sport does not develop or it develops piecemeal and, and slowly because other bodies pay for it. Or there is a major innovation of a rod licence, which I have to say I've been very surprised during the course of this that there hasn't been greater resistance to it. I think we've had very little evidence. Even one of the witnesses last week who said his organisation was against it, he was in favour of it, which probably was a rather odd way to put it. In, in all those circumstances... I think that is a crucial issue. I think the other area, if I could just deepen this for one second, convener, I think the other area is in all the discussions we've had about money, it is very elusive about what we are talking about in terms of resource that is required. There's a lot of discussion about moving resource from one place to another. There's a lot of discussion about uh, the potential for resource being found. But nobody is putting a figure on it. I mean, I've heard no figures this morning. I think it's almost impossible to find a figure on it. And if there is no figure on it, and if there's no figure on the savings that might be made by different structures, then we are going to have to sit down and say, where do we find additional resource? If the resource we've got so far hasn't produced the effects we want, and there is no likelihood of additional resource being available, where do we get the money? I'm not asking for money, I'm, uh, uh, an answer. I'm just pointing out this is a central conundrum, which I don't think the Fisheries Review resolves, but it has a suggestion about how it might do so. But it will need to be addressed because I have, I, I, alas, I have some experience of reform which is meant to produce resources. And of course, all the reforms I've been involved in have produced resources. But it, it is possible that that doesn't always happen. You know, so we need to find where the money is coming from. That we are very keen to be working with the committee you know, around that issue ahead of you know, sort of bringing forward the consultation. I mean, you know, we are currently right now at a very, very early stage. Um, in our thinking around this and you know there obviously there is going to be lots of opportunity um, for both the committee and the sector to be able to uh, influence uh, our thinking ahead of us bringing forward um, the consultation. We are going to have to, if I may use term, grasp this salmon at some stage quite firmly because there has been a review, you know, we've had all these bodies around the table, uh, the number of salmon is falling there is a, a conservation issue which is becoming extremely pressing and there is a conflict within the system and people are going to have to take some pain in this. And sometimes it's better to bring the pain on more quickly than to keep talking about it in the hope that we might not notice. Listen first, yeah. Could I just make a... Uh, yes, continue. I, I, I wouldn't want the Minister to think... Um, that there is no resistance to the introduction of a rod licence, um, as Mike Russell has sort of hinted at, because uh, I've had quite a lot of local, and I suspect she's had some of the same emails that, emails that I've had, um, on the possible impact, particularly on, on tourism in, in some of the more fragile, some of the, the lesser known rivers. Um, and I, th I just, while I, I agree in a way, I thought there might be more resistance to it, but what I am getting, um, and we heard some evidence about this last week, was that um, it would probably be more welcome if the funding received, uh, if the resource that was freed up by a rod licence was put into the improvement of the rivers yeah. and the fisheries themselves, rather than necessary, a, a slightly nebulous at this stage, angling for all programme, the details of which we don't know, but which, to my mind, builds a certain bureaucratic element around it that might take up a lot of the resource that was actually raised. So I simply put that as a thought. It's not, this is not by any means unanimous at this point that this is a, a great idea. I'm not saying it's a bad idea either, but I think there's a bit of work to be done on it. Yeah. 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 
very brief question to follow up the process. I'm trying to tease out, because um, you're very keen to get our ideas and our views, but we kind of need to have a bit more sense of, we've got the review, it's come up with a number of questions. Is there not a stage of answering some of those questions before you bring forward proposals later in the year? Um, yes, there will be. Um, once we've um, once we've come through with the with the review as well, and ahead of the consultation, that, um, then we will be. I'm very happy to come back to the committee at that stage. But will there be a publication of issues like the the resources available, um, what it is you think needs to be spent, costings of different options, before you actually say this is the structure we're going for and we're consulting on it? I think the. Um as the Minister um, touched on earlier, this is, this is a, there's, a, there's a sequence of events here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've had the, the Fishery Review Report, which has come up with 53 recommendations. Um, we are listening with great interest to, to the evidence that the committee has received so far and, and to your comments today. The next stage for us is to, to come forward in the spring with a consultation on broad principles of what a management system would look like. And that gives another opportunity for iteration, both here and, and in the, the wider sector, sectoral interests. And it's after that that we then come to the point of what does an actual management system look like and what would the legislation to support that management system look like and what would it cost? So I think we are we're, we're a step short of answering the, the, the questions um, that you've raised in, in relation to specific resources. Um, but there is it's a staged process to, because well, one of the reasons is, as the Minister said, the, the, this has been on the, on the stocks for a number of years with the possibility of reforming and nobody's picked it up because it has been so difficult. So we want to make sure that when we get to the point of a draft bill that we've actually gone through the process and consulted and understood the issues and come forward with a bill which makes sense and, and garners broad support. Uh, one of the things we are also going to be doing is we are, we'll establish um, an external stakeholder uh, reference group to help steer the development of the broad principles for a new management system through to detailed proposals and new legislation. And we've also um, seconded uh, Alan Wells from the Association of the Salmon Fishery Boards to the Wild Fisheries uh, team in Marine Scotland to help us with the process. Thank you for that. Um, first of all, there's two things I have to, to, to try and get about this. You talked about bringing forward consultations in the spring. Can you be any more specific about the timing that this will uh, know? Because we need to uh, know what input we're going to get from you when we make a report to you. Uh, we need to be able to engage with this. Uh, fit, obviously, your timetable, our timetable. Can you be more precise about the timings? It'll be around Easter time that we'll be bringing forward the uh, consultation. Well, that's very helpful. I just have a final point about income that uh, hasn't been discussed. We know that uh, the rebate for shooting rates has been, uh, is being removed. There were fishing rates as well in the past. What is your intention with regard to them? And would they be a source of income? Yeah. I think the, uh, we come back, I think, to the point that we, we are at the, the, the point of discussing broad principles of a management system. <clears throat> the, the delivery of the revenue to support that management system is part of the equation. Um, so we, we have not taken specific views um, on, on issues such as, as fishery rates, because in, in the context of, of the management system that come forward, the, there may be a different proposition for raising money. So I think it, it's not about, um, are we going to replace X with Y? We, we need to understand what the new system looks like and then how, how it can be funded. Well, I hope you take into account the potential for fishing uh, rates in that, uh, but I'm sure we'll be saying so more formally in our response. Um, can we move on to sustainable harvesting? And Alec Ferguson is going to ask the next question. Sorry, I'm still, I'm still slightly 
shaking from the idea of fishing rates on top of an annual levy because I can't help feeling that the two are much the same thing, but hey. Well, we have to sort that the, out. The devil will be in the detail, no doubt. As it in the past, we've had fishing rates, so maybe it's something which has to be taken into account since they were only rebated. I, I guess that discussion is for another time, convener. Um, thank you. Could we move on? Yes, if we could move on. Uh, Mr Cowan has already mentioned the, the licence to kill um, that was proposed by the review group. And um, while uh, I think we'll probably all be quite pressed by the amount of common ground there is with stakeholders in some of these recommendations, this is one that caused a bit of uh, controversy. And I have to say that when you look at it first, it looks very simple effectively a quota on the number of fish taken, but I, I do find it's one of these things, the more you look at it, the more complex and difficult it becomes, L largely for, for practical reasons, how you actually implement it. Um, and, you know, we've heard evidence and, and about the, the, the number of runs that each river could have of, of different, different runs of salmon, the number of beats on different rivers, the number of varying number of proprietors on the rivers and, and when you start thinking about how you apply these licenses or quotas across those beats and across those proprietors and across those rivers, particularly given the, the, the volatility of annual runs of salmon and the differences of runs within each season, it begins to look uh, how, how on earth do you practically um, implement this. Um, uh, and I do absolutely understand uh, Mr Cowan when he said that the, the whole purpose of this was to ensure uh, not that certain numbers of fish are killed, but to ensure that the number, a, a, a proper number of fish are able to head up the river to ensure the continuation of the species. Um, so, so part of me, uh, and really one of my questions, and I don't know if you can yet answer this, but given the, vo the volatility or, and, and the variety of runs that can vary by sort of up to four times from one season to another, if you're basing a a number of, of salmon to be killed every year on one season's results, given that it might be doubled or halved the next season. How, how do you do that with a degree, with sustainability in mind? How do you do that? And, and how do you prevent what looks like a, a, quite a simple system to begin with becoming hugely complex and therefore bureaucratic and very expensive at the end of the day? Um, well, yes, I mean, we are, obviously, we are currently um, consulting on the kill licence, you know, obviously the objective of which is to ensure that, you know, harvesting in domestic Scottish waters is sustainable. But, you know, I also want to um, clarify that, you know, our salmon, you know, they are a, a national resource, they are a protected species under the, the Habitats um, Directive with a number of variables um, impacting on them. And, you know, the fish are currently being killed with no... Um, no assessment of a national level of the sustainability of that activity. So we need to try and put in place you know, an appropriate regulatory structure in order to ensure that an appropriate number of fish uh, remain uh, in the system and they, uh, and they, go, on to, they go on to spawn. You know, this is you know, a conservation measure for a protected um, species and this is about you know, how we actually manage that protected species. So... so I mean, I, do, I absolutely understand that, and I understand the reasoning, the thinking behind it. But, you know, uh, have you thought of yet the, the, the technical difficulties, the practical difficulties of implementing this, given the variations that I tried to highlight in, the, in each river and in each season? Um, well, we know that, um, you know, that, you know, the number of people who want this, including, the, you know, the Association of the Salmon Fisheries Board, the Institute of Fishery Management, um, SANA and the Gatekeepers, um, association and there are other other countries that retain the resource uh, in this way in the interest of conservation which you know is notably um, Ireland you know we know this is highly challenging but we do need to make our best efforts to you know address a strong um, recommendation of the report because that was one of the things that the Wild Fisheries Review mm -hmm. did make mm -hmm. very clear to us they wanted to see immediate action taken around this area in terms of conserving uh, our protected species. Okay thank you. Uh, and Graham Day. Uh, thank you. The review proposes creating an offensive, reckless or irresponsible management of fishing rights, yet the committee heard evidence last week uh, raising doubt over how this might work in practice. Minister, do you believe introducing such an offence would be workable? And I also wonder in terms of issuing and renewing licences to kill fish, whether we ought to have in place a fit and proper person test. Well, in terms of your, your first question, also, as, you know, as we've already said, you know, we're planning to consult on those broad principles for the new management 
um, system and we will consider in the round the appropriate uh, regulatory requirements to ensure that there is effective um, and consistent um, compliance. But perhaps I'll hand over to Willie for the next. Yeah. Again, as I've said a couple of times this morning, the, the, the proposition of the review and, and the consultation which will be forthcoming is not that we, we, we pick away individual points and try and fix something which is wrong today by, by addressing a single issue. So when we have a, a proposition for a, a management structure, obviously that will need to have a... a um, a weather eye to compliance with it. And it's at that point that I think we, we say, well, what, what, what works well in terms of compliance, <coughs> excuse me, with the existing regulatory structure and what might be transferred over and or is there a different approach? And when we, we come forward with um, the proposition the, for the management structure, um, I think the, the issue of The kill licence in itself will restrict the ability of, of individual proprietors to kill fish, with, obviously, without the licence. As the Minister said earlier, at the minute, government has no control over the number of fish that are taken either by nets or by rod and line. So the, the kill licence in itself will regulate the behaviour of, of people in the fishery in that it will limit the, the number of, of fish that can be taken. So to that extent, it may be that the, the kill licence actually um, impacts or, or, or positively impacts on, on the issue that, that was in the report. But as I said, the, 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 the key um, position for us in developing a new management system is what does a new management system look like? How do we ensure compliance? And ensuring compliance may be similar to what we've got today or it may be different, but we need to figure that out in the light of what the new system looks like. Okay, if, if I make you could, could you explain to Mr Cowan where heritable rights will sit uh, in relation to the licence to kill? Because uh, from a legal standpoint, if someone has heritable rights, can they just not continue carry on f fishing regardless? Um, the, the, the heritable right or the, the, the heritable right for salmon fisheries is a property right and that enables the, the owner of those rights to fish. But the government in the national interest um, can impact on that right if it if it feels that excuse me, there's there's a there's a rational need to do so. And obviously in, in the in the case of salmon fisheries, uh, some of some of the stocks are vulnerable. Therefore, in the public interest, the government has the right to, to impact on the property right. right. That's useful. Thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, during the evidence session last week, uh, it was suggested that Scotland is now uh, behind the curve uh, with its lack of a policy on, on mixed stock fisheries. Um, now, the, the NASCO position stipulates in its guidelines that fisheries should only be allowed if there is an exploitable surplus. Uh, and on that issue, we, we also heard of the need for much more research uh, in the short to medium term, which I think we'll go on to, uh, to, to discuss shortly. Um, however, uh, do you consider, Minister, uh, that the approach proposed by the review is sufficient to allow Scotland to comply with its international obligations uh, with regard to uh, NASCO and the Habitats Directive? Um, I think in terms of um, NASCO uh, and the EU, they obviously recognise um, that the mixed stock fisheries um, present particular difficulties for uh, the management of salmon populations, and that's where the kill licence would um, provide a trigger to assess the impact uh, of such fisheries on you know, our special areas of conservation. And one of the benefits of such an approach is the ability um, to use that process to manage uh, mixed stock uh, fisheries. And this will align with the approach and the requirements of the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation and the Habitats Directive, and to enable us to be seen to be doing so at the same time. OK. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, scientific advice, uh, Sarah Boyack. Convener, um, one of the key areas identified in the review group um, was the need to 
have a look at the the research requirements and it said that actually um, although they'd identified some gaps they didn't actually think we needed to substantially increase resources for data collection but actually when you look at the list of issues where they thought there was more research needed it's actually quite a substantial um, list of issues um, criteria for salmon killing salmon killing license applications um, the link between sil salmon licenses issued and then the impact on stocks um, to follow up the points just made by Angus there, salmon-related data for reporting to the EU and NASCO, um, general information about habitat, productivity, resilience of fish stocks, and what sort of en enhancement needs to be carried out, um, and a basic mapping of all our species wild fisheries resource across Scotland. Um, then looking at the issue of catch and rele release as a conservation tool, particularly looking at the number of fish that die through that process and the number that survive. Then looking at threats to wild fisheries and then looking at market research. And that was one of the issues you picked up about socio-economic opportunities. That feels like quite a substantial range of research. So is the theory that that money will come up from um, the local money that is collected and that that will be sufficient to fund those research priorities? Um, all I can say um, is that the fisheries management obviously does need to be underpinned um, by sound science and um, use of the best uh, available evidence and obviously you know, the review did recommend a national research and data strategy. So the respective roles and functions in delivery of research priorities at national and local level will be a very uh, key part of the forthcoming um, consultation. You know, research is currently uh, commissioned and conducted at both national and the local level. So I would anticipate that under a national research and data strategy that this approach would continue. But I'm going to bring in um, Carol Barker Monroe just to talk you through some of the, the research that's currently been funded. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, you're right, that's a, a long list of, of things to be looking at. Um, but I would um, make one comment that, that all of these things are not new. A number of elements of this work are already being undertaken, both either by Marine Scotland Science, some of it's being done by local boards. So I would imagine that, that one of the first orders in terms of draw, drawing together a national research and data strategy would be to map exactly where we are with each of those pieces of work, find out where lessons could be learned, and then be able to prioritise that list. Um, so I, I don't think that we would be starting from scratch in that. A number of pieces of work are already underway, possibly under a different badge or for a different purpose. So there's already a good bank of work there. Um, and, and we would look to build on that in terms of taking forward the national strategy for research and data. So wouldn't that be the first starting point to establish that research and science base now? Because um, the follow-on question is really about the capacity of fisheries management organisations to actually carry out that research. So do you envisage people that are currently doing research for the Scottish Government being shifted on to that? Or is this a question of um, the work that's done by local fisheries organisations being pulled up to the centre? I don't know if I could comment in terms of what it might mean in terms of people being tasked with doing different things. I think there's a, there's a, a question to be asked. An, an awful lot of what is in um, the Wild Fisheries Review has to do with structures and reforms that can only be taken forward through legislation. There's also not an awful lot of other work, like, for example, the development of a national strategy, which wouldn't require legislation in order to get started on it. So that it could be that whilst we're looking at broader structures, um, decisions are taken to start with some of that work now and what that, what that might mean in terms of, as you said, pulling together who's doing what and for what purpose. Could it be better aligned? Is, the, is there enough information being shared um, about what's happening? It's, it might not necessarily be about moving people about, but a shared understanding of who's doing what and making sure that lessons are learned across the piece from that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very helpful answer because it, it does feel like there's a a large number of unanswered questions and almost scoping what we currently know, what work is going on, and then thinking about how the change at the local level will actually help with this. I mean, one of the concerns is clearly what the impact potentially is on the funding of local work for local management. And it's just to tease out the, the difference between a national priority and national funding that would come up from the local level, but what again is left at the local level to enable people to carry out that work. I mean, one of the suggestions is about looking at citizen science. You need a framework for reporting citizen science in, and it, it's just to what extent is, is the local mechanism 
going to be identified as responsible for bottom-up stuff or to what extent is it a kind of Marine Scotland overview? Just trying to get a sense of the, the national unit, just how ambitious it's, it's going to be in terms of setting the agenda for research and then carrying it out. It's not going to be a bit of consultation anyway. Yeah, I think, I think those, are, those are issues that say we'll, we'll start to come through in the consultation when we start talking about who should be doing what. But as I said, the, there's an element of work that can be done now to start mapping out who's doing what whilst considering who should be doing what in the future and then being able to marry the two so that we understand the impact of moving from the structure that we've got at the moment to the, to the new one. I and agree. I think costing it and thinking about the staffing resource as well is crucial. Very slightly. I, just, I just want to again highlight what I think is, is the crucial need for local flexibility within this because while I, I think it's very sensible to carry out a mapping exercise of everything that's going on and bring it all together so we've got a clear overall insight into what is being done, um, there are local priorities that might not make the national list. I give you, for example, the acidification that is the biggest problem in my part of Scotland, in the southwest. That may not be a national priority. Uh, come the day, but it needs to be, it needs to remain a local priority. So I simply put a plea to you to, to, to keep that local flexibility in place, whatever the, the final structure might be. I know, that's clocked, Mr Ferguson. But uh, r regulation and compliance questions now. Uh, Graham Day. Thanks, Secretary. Uh, I, I wonder if the government has any plans to look at extending the annual close time for salmon fisheries beyond those that were recently legislated for. I ask that in part because no sooner had the new close time arrangements been announced on the ESC than the S district board were asking anglers on all of the rivers that they oversee not to kill fish until I think it was the 1st of July, which suggests in particular circumstances, those with a local knowledge perhaps feel there's a need to go further than we've gone so far in order to protect stocks. Um, I think it is important um, to ensure that the system in the round um, delivers adequate protection. You know, annual um, close times are part of the current framework, but we could also look at this issue in conjunction um, with the kill licence rather than in isolation. So, and such an approach might result uh, in a similar outcome in terms of uh, protection afforded to fish at particular uh, times of the year. But again, this is something I would very much welcome uh, members' views um, around this issue. And I think, you know, we know that there are a number of exceptions in terms, as you pointed out, um, Mr Day, that the annual close time within the ESC uh, salmon fishery district has been extended until the 30th of April. Therefore, netting has been delayed until the 1st of May and spring fishing by rod and line prior to the 1st of May is on a catch and release um, basis. The extended annual close time does not apply in the extra salmon fishing district as the existing season start date of the 1st of May has been preserved and also in terms of the Annan salmon fishery um, district where the existing statutory measures um, require the release of all salmon prior to the 1st of June have been preserved and again this is all come back down to trying to manage you know, a species that is, um, that is protected under the Habitats Directive. Can I turn your attention to protection orders, Minister? Uh, the review has some proposals on these. Uh, we're wondering, uh, given the evidence we've had, whether we should in fact see a national system of protection orders. We've had supplementary evidence that suggests that uh, in some parts of the TAE system uh, that they work very well, where there's been no problems. But in others, there's a suggestion that in fact uh, they could uh, the Tay um, District Salmon Fishery Board, you know, broadly welcome the idea of the principle and the recommendations. I wonder if you've got a sense of uh, how protection orders can be used across the species. Well, I think in the in the current system, um, protection orders were intended um, to play a part in responsible access to fishing, and obviously, access to fishing is a theme which you know runs throughout the report, we've touched on it a brief, very briefly already, and it's something that I wish to see uh, a key feature of the management system. So, you know, I'm therefore very open um, to suggestions about how this can be achieved and whether um, protection orders should be part of that. Okay, at this stage, we'll recognise there may be questions about that in the consultation. Thank you. Um, Mike Russell. 
do the opportunity in legislation exists to redefine or properly define the role of bailiffs? And I think the committee has, uh, at least a couple of people in the committee, have expressed concern uh, in the other question sessions about the role. The report uh, indicates that the police's position is that there are powers that bailiffs have that they are not using. I think there's also, certainly from my perspective, a, a concern that across the environment there are often people who take on uh, roles for which a, a better judicial or legislative training is required. And sometimes if they don't have that or if they exercise it in the wrong way, it can create difficulties. Is this an area, I'm only seeking from you a commitment that this is an area that will be considered in the consultation because I think it gives an opportunity to properly define the role of bailiffs. For example, some of the rangers in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park qualify as special constables, which gives them essentially a proper context in which they can undertake some quite difficult work. Um, can I thank the member for that, um, for raising that issue? I mean, obviously, uh, anyone exercising powers under the law must do so within a framework uh, which has the appropriate training, as you quite rightly pointed out, along with the checks and balances. The system of water bailiffs, um, you know, is unusual in terms of law enforcement, but it does provide, you know, a strong element of local knowledge uh, and experience, you know, things which, you know, many argue should be uh, retained. So, you know, obviously I can't take a, a position on the recommendations today, but I'm, you know, I'm very open to how um, fisheries law should be uh, enforced and whether, you know, the committee feels that the recommendations that have been made are the right ones or whether something else is needed uh, in the mix. You know, it is important, I think, to point out that the enforcement <coughs> powers available and the way in which they are exercised are, are different matters, but it is something that we're very keen to have a look at through the consultation. Fergus? Have you finished, Mr Russell? Yes, just a very brief um, continuation of that. Um, I mean, I, I suspect that if we end up introducing rod licences and licences to kill and quotas, this is going to require more policing rather than less, and therefore this subject of who polices it is extremely important, um, because there's no point in having all this in place if there isn't sufficient um, policing ability, policing with a small p, um, in there. And I, I just um, hope that's something that is borne in mind as these proposals are taken forward. Indeed. OK, no answers to that. You're taking it on board. Well, thank you, Minister, and your team just now. Uh, that gives us a very good discussion on these matters. Um, we'll have a short suspension, five minutes max, uh, to allow witnesses to switch over, and uh, we will suspend for the moment.
Hart right now. Thank you very much. Uh, the third item on our agenda today is to begin our consideration of amendments to Part 4 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill at Stage 2. And I welcome the officials joining the Minister. Uh, uh, Minister, welcome again, along with uh, Dave Thompson, uh, Land Reform and Tenancy Unit, uh, Elizabeth Connell, Scottish Government Lawyer, and uh, David McLeish, uh, Parliamentary Council. Everyone should have with them a copy of the Bill as introduced, uh, the Marshall List of Amendments that was published on Monday, and the groupings of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they'll be debated. There will be one debate in each group of amendments. <clears throat> I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak uh, to and move that amendment and to speak to all the other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching my eye. If uh, the Minister has not already spoken in the group, I will invite the Minister to contribute to the debate uh, just before I move to the winding up speech. Uh, the debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw it. If that wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, I will check whether any other member objects, and if any committee member does object, the amendment is not withdrawn and the committee must immediately move to vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Please note that any other MSP present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote, and voting in any division is by a show of hands, and it's important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, and so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Uh, we have agreed that we will consider sections 27 to 47, and any new amendments inserting new sections after section 47 today. If we do not get that far, we will stop at an appropriate point and pick up next week where we left off. So uh, we will make a start now uh, by looking at group one, the nature of land in which community interests may be registered under part of uh, the 2003 Act. Uh, separate tenements. I call amendments 12 in the name of the Minister, group with amendments 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17. Minister to move uh, amendment 12 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. The current provisions of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 state in section 33.1 that land in which a community interest may be registered under part 2 of the 2003 Act is any land other than excluded land. Excluded land is defined in section 33.2 as land described as such in an order made by ministers. The bill as introduced amended the definition of excluded land so that it is land consisting of mineral rights to oil, coal, gas, gold or silver which are owned separately from the land in respect of which they are executable with the exception of salmon fishing and mineral rights. The current provisions do not exclude other separate tenements such as oyster mussel gathering rights, rights of port and ferry and sporting rights. So the purpose of amendments 12 to 17 is to exclude from the land in respect of which a community interest may be registered all separate tenements which are owned separately from the land except salmon fishings and mineral rights other than rights to oil, coal, gas, gold or silver. This means that salmon fishings and mineral rights other than the rights to oil, coal, gas, gold or silver, are the only separate tenements which are land in which a community interest may be, re may be registered under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. So specifically, Amendment 12 inserts specific reference to a separate tenement. Amendment 13 changes the wording from the plural to the singular to take account 
of the change in terminology from mineral rights to a separate tenement. Amendment 14 inserts reference to the exceptions to the definition of excluded land uh, set out in subsection 2A, for example, salmon fishing or certain mineral rights. Amendment 15 amends subsection 2A to take account of the change of structure to either section caused by the new reference to separate tenements. Amendment 16 ensures that rights to oil, coal, gas, gold or silver are not included in the exception of mineral rights from the definition of excluded land. So, convener, this group of amendments seeks to bring Part 2 of the 2003 Act in line with Section 68 of Part 3, which describes eligible croft land. So I would invite the committee to support these amendments and I move uh, Amendment 12. Thank you. Are there any members wish to speak? Alex <coughs> Ferguson. Um, Thank you, Convener. I, I, I just, I, I'm not against this proposal at all, but just so that I can f better understand exactly what the implications of it are, is, it, is, there, an ex is, there, a, 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 is there a full list of what te other, other tenements includes? Um, because I, I just feel that it's asking us to agree something that appears to be fairly open-ended. I know you've mentioned oyster and mussel and salmon fishing, but I just wonder if it's possible to define exactly what this phrase, um, or a, a separate tenement, actually does include. Um, I think we can, um, we can provide uh, a full list um, around that. Um, and also, um, also, what we're, so also what we're trying to do is to ensure that we've got clarity there um, surrounding what the separate tenements uh, owned separately from the land are eligible for which a community body can specify um, their interests, but we'd be very happy to provide a, a, full, a full list. I think that would be useful for stage yes. three, if, if I may. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other members wish to speak? No. Uh, Minister, wish to wind up? No. Um, Thank you. Well, the question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I call the amendments 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 13 to 17 on block. Uh, moved on block. Thank you. Ask whether any uh, member objects to a single question being put in the amendments 13 to 17. No. Uh, if no member objects, then, as nobody has, uh, the question is that amendments 13 to 17 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. The question is that section 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call group two, ways in which community bodies and crofting community bodies may be constituted, and call amendment 18 in the name of the minister, group with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Uh, the Minister to move Amendment 18 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. I'm very conscious there's quite a lot here for us to, um, to get through, so I will try and um, go through as quickly as I, as I can. Um, stakeholders have indicated a need for legislation to offer a wider range of legal bodies which a community could use when forming a community body for the purposes of registering an interest in land or exercising a right to buy under Part 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. These amendments offer community bodies more flexibility in deciding which form of community body best suits them. Now, stakeholders highlighted that the Scottish charitable incorporated organisations and community benefit companies as being suitable bodies for the purposes of the community right to buy. So an amendment to the 2003 Act which provides that a community body can take the form uh, of a scale in addition to the option of being a company limited by guarantee is set out in section 28 of the bill as introduced. Amendment 18 uh, is a technical amendment to pave the way for Amendment 22. That amendment seeks to add community benefit societies as another type of legal entity which a community can use to form a community body for the purposes of registering an interest in land and to exercise the community right to buy. So amendments 18 and 22 are in response to stakeholders' requirements for greater flexibility in the types of body that are considered to be suitable for a community body. In order to be a community body, the legal entity forming the community body, which if amendments 18 and 22 are accepted, will be a company limited by guarantee, Scottish Incorporated Charitable Organisation or Community Benefit Society, has to have articles of association, a constitution 
or registered rules that meet certain requirements. And this is in relation to amendments 19, 20 and 21. So one of the current requirements is that the Articles Constitutional Registered Rules must state that the community body must have at least 20 members. So Amendment 19 amends the list of requirements that a company limited by guarantees articles must comply with in order to be a community body in two respects. Firstly, it amends the requirements to provide that they must state that the community body must have at least 10 members rather than the current minimum requirement of 20. So that was intended to address difficulties which were highlighted uh, by this committee that some smaller or remote communities may experience in finding enough members to form the community body. And secondly, it amends the list so that the proportion of members of a community body who must be members of the community is increased from majority to three quarters. So that's to ensure that even for community bodies where the number of members are small, the interests of the local community uh, are protected. Um, so Amendment 20, that amends the list of requirements that a Scottish charitable uh, incorporated organisation's constitution must comply with in order to be a community body to provide that it must contain a provision that the community body must have at least uh, 10 members rather than the current minimum requirement of 20. And Amendment 21 also amends one of the requirements of the constitution of a community body, which is a Scottish incorporated charitable organisation, so that the portion of members of the body who must be members of the community is increased from a majority um, to three quarters. Amendment 22 seeks to set out the requirements that the registered rules of community benefit societies must contain in order for it to be a, a community uh, body. Uh, Amendment 23, uh, ministers currently have the power to disapply the requirement that the articles of a company limited by guarantee or constitution uh, of a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation must state that the community body must have at least uh, 20 members. So if Amendments 19, 20 and 21 are accepted, uh, then this power will be for the Minister to disapply the requirement uh, that the Articles or Constitution state that the community body must have 10 members rather than disapply the requirement they have 20. Uh, Amendment 23 extends this power to also apply to the requirement that the registered rules of community benefit societies must state that the community body must have a minimum number of 10 members. Um, amendment 24, under the bill as introduced, ministers have the power to amend the subsections listing the types of legal entities that communities can use to form a community body. And this amendment would enable ministers to amend provisions relating to community benefit societies inserted by Amendment 22. Amendment 25 is a consequential amendment resulting from the addition of community benefit societies as a type of body that communities can use to form a community body. So the amendment adds the definitions of community benefit society and registered rules to the bill. With Amendment 26, in accordance with the 2003 Act and the bill as introduced, community bodies are prohibited from modifying their memorandum, articles of association or constitution without ministers' consent in writing during the period beginning with the application being made and ending with either the registration of the community interest in land a decision by ministers that the community interest should not be registered, ministers declining to consider the application or withdrawal of the application. So Amendment 26 extends this to include a prohibition on modifying a community body's registered rules in the case of community benefit societies. Uh, Amendment 27, in accordance with the 2003 Act and the Bill as introduced, community bodies are prohibited from modifying their memorandum, articles of association or constitution without minister's consent in writing for as long as the interest remains registered or, as the case may be, the land remains in its ownership. So Amendment 27 extends this to include a prohibition on modifying a community body's registered rules in the case of a community body which is a community benefit society. Moving on to Amendment 33. Uh, the Crofting Community Right to Buy in Part 3 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 can only be exercised by crofting community bodies. And at the moment, crofting community bodies must take the form of companies limited by guarantee that meets certain requirements. So in keeping with the proposed amendments to Part 2, uh, Amendment 33 seeks to add Scottish charitable 
in cooperated organisations and community benefit societies as types of legal entity that crofting communities may use to form crofting community bodies for the purposes of exercising the crofting community right to buy. And in addition, the amendment seeks to provide that Scottish ministers can add uh, addition of types of legal entity at a later date should it be deemed necessary. And this amendment also seeks to amend the requirements of the Articles of Association of a Crofting Community Body, which is a company limited by guarantee. It also proposes to amend the requirement that the Articles of a Crofting Community Body, which is a company limited by guarantee, must state that the body have a majority of members who are members of the crofting community. And the amendment seeks to increase this requirement so that the articles will state that three quarters of the members must be members of the crofting community. So the amendment also seeks to remove the requirement for a crofting community body to arrange for its accounts to be audited, whilst retaining the requirement for crofting community bodies to ensure proper management for proper arrangement, sorry, for financial uh, management. And that proposed amendment is to try and avoid uh, confusion for the crofting community bodies about the types of audit that they must carry out and will prevent an unnecessary uh, duplication of effort. The body will continue to submit an audit of accounts by the appropriate governing body, Companies House, Office of the Scottish Charities Regulator or Financial Conduct Authority, as appropriate to the type of legal entity. This is in line with the proposed amendments that are made to Part 2 of the 2003 Act. The amendment also addresses issues relating to the definition of a crofting community for the purposes of the crofting community right to buy. At present, the definition of a crofting community may not always include all those who would consider themselves to be members of the crofting community. So this amendment changes the definition of a crofting community in an attempt to try and capture uh, those persons who consider themselves uh, to be members of the crofting community, but at present may find themselves excluded from the crofting community definition. So an example of that might be you know, a crofter who's aged 16 or 17 years old who would consider themselves to be a member of the crofting community, but excluded from the definition due to not being included in the electoral um, register. Uh, at the moment, there are two registers that contain details of crofters. One is the Register of Crofts, which is held by the Crofting Commission, and the second is the newer Crofting Register, uh, which is held by the Registers of Scotland. So we want to enable communities to be able to rely on the information held in either of the registers in determining who are crofters uh, in relation to the land which they are trying to purchase, including both tenants and owner-occupiers. Uh, information on tenants is held in both um, registers, but currently, as we said last week, the Crofting Commission uh, do not have a duty to collect information on owner-occupiers, and that means that we can't amend the bill at this stage. To set out the definition of a crofting community should rely on information about owner-occupier crofts held in the registers of crofts. So we've therefore proposed to give ministers the power to make regulations to extend the definition of crofting community at a later date. Now, if the requirements of the Crofting Commission in relation to keeping owner-occupiers' details on the register of crofts should change in the future, then ministers could use this power to extend the definition of a crofting community accordingly. And we certainly propose to liaise uh, with the Crofting Commission about this issue. The proposed amendment also seeks to remove the requirement that members of the crofting community have to be resident within 16 kilometres uh, of the crofting township, which is situated in or otherwise associated uh, with the croft land. Uh, if accepted, these proposed changes uh, mean that the effect of the amendment would be that the definition of crofting community would be all those persons who are resident in the crofting township, which is situated in or otherwise associated uh, with the croft land, which the crofting community body has a right to buy, and who are entitled uh, to vote in local government elections in the polling district or districts in which that township is situated. They are tenants of crofts in the crofting township whose names are entered in the crofting register or register of crofts uh, as tenants of those crofts, are owner-occupier crofters of owner-occupied crofts in the crofting township whose names are entered in the crofting register as the owner-occupier crofters of such crofts, or 
are such other persons or are persons falling within a class of such other persons as may be set out by ministers in regulations. So ministers will retain the current power to define crofting community in another way if it is, in their opinion, inappropriate to define it as set out in the 2003 Act. I am nearly there. <laughs> Amendment 2. Um, the purpose of this amendment is to extend section 72 so that it includes reference to the constitution of a Scottish charitable and cooperated organisation and the registered rules of Community Benefit Society in addition to the memorandum or articles of a company limited by guarantee. Now this will ensure that crofting community bodies that are a Scottish charitable and cooperated organisations or community benefit societies cannot modify their constitutions or registered rules without minister's consent in writing once they have bought the crofting land. This amendment also seeks to insert provisions that will allow ministers to make an order relating to or to matters uh, connected with the compulsory purchase of croft land by the ministers under section 72. And it also seeks to insert a power for ministers to make such modifications or of enactments as appear necessary or expedient in consequence of any provision of such an order or otherwise in connection with the order, and that's to try and mirror the power that's included in section 97E4 and 5 of the proposed new part 3A of the 2003 Act. Amendment 40 uh, is consequential to Amendment 2 and ensures that where ministers under section 40, 72 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 exercise the power to compulsorily require land and by virtue of Amendment 2 exercise the power to make an order relating to this then that the order will be subject to the affirmative procedure. So all, all in all, this group of amendments are um, trying to give communities a greater flexibility to choose the type of community body that suits their needs. It tries to lessen the burden on communities by removing the need for auditing of accounts and ensures that smaller communities are able to take advantage of the right to buy by reducing the minimum number of members whilst ensuring the community focus is strengthened. So I would encourage the committee to support these amendments and I move Amendment 18. Thank you. We have one or two members who wish to comment. Claudia Beamish first. Uh, thank you, Convener and uh, Minister. Uh, that was certainly a, a, a wide, <laughs> wide range of um, amendments to, to cover at once. Um, uh, it was just on Amendment 21, and I do welcome the um, inclusion of SCIOs in, the, in, in, um, in this, um, from, and that that's come forward from the Scottish Government in recognition of the contribution they can make. Um, and I agree with the Minister in, in your remarks, uh, you said in relation to the amendment that the interests of the local community are protected, and I agree that that's very important. I I'm just um, would like to know uh, your, your thoughts on the, the increase from the majority to 75%, um, and uh, what, what the thinking is in a, a bit more detail on that, particularly in relation to rurality and where skios um, cross quite a, a, wide, um, a wide area, and whether that would, in fact, become more of a barrier rather than less. So um, I'm not opposed to the amendments, but I would like to understand that. The reasoning um, behind that um, was really in terms of increasing the proportion of members who must be from the uh, community, from the majority to three quarters, and was really to obviously assist in um, protecting the interests of the community, even in cases where a community body had as few as um, 10 members. And as I say, it was really to try and make sure that we try to strengthen uh, the community um, hand in this and you know, obviously because we had a decrease in the number of members proposed going down from 20 to 10 so we wanted to try and make sure that the community was strengthened and also protected as well. Thank you. Boy. Thank you, Convener. Um, I also want to welcome the fact that you've broadened the scope of community organisations that could be eligible, particularly to include a cooperative option. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about um, Amendment Number 22. And it's particularly, if you could just put on record, um, in relation to sections G, H and I, um, in relation to section G, if you could clarify who you think is likely to want to exercise this right and what you would think of as um, being reasonable. Um, implication is what wouldn't be reasonable, um, which in relation to paragraph H, 
just to clarify what the circumstances might be where it would be legitimate for the society to withhold information. Um, and then in relation to point I, um, who would decide in the circumstances where this provision was appropriate, how those surplus funds were actually to be applied, who would have the, the final say on that? Thank you. Well, in terms of the, who would have the the, um, the final say in that, that's um, that's up for um, <coughs> ministers to decide on that. And uh, you know, the minister, you know, it's, it's you know, it's going um, too far in the private about the private sessions. Do you clear, I couldn't hear that last. Um, the minutes are um, going back too far, so it would be um, going back too far for the private sessions. So, and it would also be ministers that would um, decide that around Amendment Twenty Two. That a body is not a community body unless so be ministers have given it, you know, um, written uh, written confirmation that they are satisfied about the main uh, purpose of the body and to make sure that it is uh, consistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development. So that would be for the ministers to do in written confirmation. And for each for each individual request, that's what would be for the ministers, and they would uh, do it in written confirmation. And for sections G and H. Be, yeah, it would be for each individual request. It would be for the community body um, to decide. So there's no interpretation of what reasonable is, or who you expect would want to get access to the information. Well, I think this is also it's in line with the freedom of information requests as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike Russell. Yes. Um, <coughs> I think if there are, if for viewers at home, if there are any left, uh, they would understand the classic Highland definition of a croft being a piece of land bounded by regulation. But I want to very strongly welcome uh, Amendment 33. Peter Peacock, in his evidence to the committee in oh. November, pointed out that the uh, land reform legislation of 2003, welcome as it was, and he used the words, were, was hugely cumbersome, difficult and bureaucratic uh, for communities to use. And that is partly because of the inflexibility of the legislation. Uh, subsection 6 of Amendment 33 if I'm right, gives the uh, opportunity by secondary legislation to define both the crofting community body and to define the crofting community. Now, both of which create a flexibility that is not in present legislation in terms of community right to buy. Just for the record, because this is, uh, this is the type of thing that uh, if there is a dispute about um, a legislation, what is said in, at stages of the bill is important. Presumably, it is in the government's mind to use that flexibility in a constructive way rather than a restrictive way to look at the emergence of new community bodies, which is the issue, for example, with, with, with the, the, the definition of a community body, and to make sure that uh, crofting communities are defined in a way as working communities, which is the, the, the burden of what the, Croft, the Crofters Commission or Crofting Commission does, rather than to define them in any way that would uh, assist those who are not working their crofts. It's just to make sure that we understand that this is a progressive and flexible measure rather than a measure that might be used regressively. No, and I can give the member that um, commitment and that assurance that what we're trying to do was always try and simplify the process as much as we could and to try and get greater flexibility um, into it. And obviously, you know, it does involve taking a, a ministerial power to expand via the regulation to definition of crofting community, but that's supposed to be in a, in a progressive and productive way. Thank you. Can I ask the minister to clarify one point? You talked about people who are to live 16 kilometres from their croft. What is that... Uh, power in relation to uh, the 32 kilometre uh, rule, which I think was brought in laterally. Um, is this something which impinges on the amendments that you brought forward?
So, okay, so currently at the moment the Crofting Act is uses um, the 32 kilometre and this Act is obviously using the, um, the 16 um, kilometres and you know, at the moment the two Acts are they're, they're currently out of sync so we're trying to make sure that we've got greater alignment. Well, yeah, just um, just a, 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 a point to make. I, I would I'd be concerned if it was to be reduced overall from 32 kilometres to 16. No, it's not. It's likely. not likely to do no. so. No. Okay. Well, not we'll get, seek some clarity after this, I think, with regard to these two acts that don't seem to be in sync. But uh, meanwhile, Minister, do you want to wind up? Um, I'm quite happy just to move our amendments. So are we. Um, so the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 and 25 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 19 to 25 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on the amendments 19 to 25? No. Uh, if there are no members objecting, then the question is that amendments 19 to 25 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that section 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Uh, call amendment 26 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 18. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 18. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we move to Group 3. Salmon Fishings and Mineral Rights Public Notice of Certain Applications under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. Call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister in a group of its own. Minister to move and speak to the amendment. I can assure the committee this one will be a lot shorter than the last group. <laughs> Uh, convener, in circumstances where a community body is seeking to register an interest in land under Part 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 and the landowner is unknown or cannot be found, they are currently required to affix a conspicuous notice to a part of the land over which they wish to register uh, an interest. However, it has been recognised that in cases where the community body is seeking to register an interest over salmon, fishings or mineral rights, and these rights are owned separately from the land, that it's not possible to affix a notice to these rights. So therefore, in circumstances where the community body is seeking to register an interest in salmon fishings or mineral rights, which are owned separately from the land, Amendment 28 removes the requirement for a conspicuous notice to be affixed to the land where the owner is unknown or cannot be found. So the amendment inserts a ministerial power to set out in regulations the type of advertisement that is required in these circumstances. And I'd ask the committee to support this amendment and I move amendment 28. Does anyone wish to comment? Nobody wishes to comment. Do you wish to wind up, Minister? No, thank you. So the question is, Amendment 28 is agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, group 4, a uh, period for indicating approval under Section 38 of the 2003 Act. I call Amendment 48, the name of Dave Thompson, grouped with Amendment 29. Mike Russell to move Amendment uh, uh, 48 and speak to both amendments in the group. Convener, this is a probing amendment and it fits in very well with the discussion that we've had about flexibility within the bill. The bill, section 30 of the bill amends section 38 of the 2003 Act, which sets out the criteria for registration of community interests. Section 30B proposes to insert into section 38, subsection 2A, which provides that ministers may not take into account the approval of a member of the community, and I quote, if the approval was indicated earlier than six months before the date on which the application to register the community interest in land to which the approval relates was made. 
and this proposes to give for the reference to the period of six months, it should be substituted a reference to 12 months. This sort of seeks to give more flexibility, but to, to be fair, I think Amendment 29 probably does it better in the sense that it, takes, it follows the consistency of Amendment 33 and, and takes the Minister the right of um, a, a, a making a, a variation, and that variation is not tied to a particular figure. So I, I think the, uh, the purpose of this is being met if the Minister is prepared to confirm, as she did confirm earlier, that the intention is to use this to increase rather than to decrease the period, and that's why it has been uh, uh, inserted, then I think I have no great difficulty in one press. Moving it at the moment. I will move it, yes. Thank you. Uh, the Minister to speak to Amendment 29 and other amendments in the group. Um, in terms of Amendment um, 48, um, you know, I do uh, welcome the probing amendment and I do accept the point that um, Mr Russell has made that Amendment 29 um, does it better. Um, obviously, Amendment 48 seeks to increase the period of approval from six months to 12 months, so the ministers may take into account the approval of a member of the community if that approval has been indicated within 12 months of the date of application and that that amendment was intended to give more flexibility to Scottish ministers to have regard um, to certain matters. The Scottish Government believes that it is important uh, for the approval of the members of the community to be uh, current and if the approval of the member of the community was given 12 months prior to the date of application, it may be the case that the community's plans or the community itself uh, may have changed uh, during that time and that was why um, I would ask um, Mr Wattle to withdraw his amendment but on Amendment 29 um, to cater for the event that the six-month approval period causes difficulties for communities in the future. Um, the Scottish Government has lodged this amendment to give ministers the power by regulations to amend the six-month time limit in which the approval of a member of the community supporting a community body's application must be uh, dated. And this will obviously allow ministers uh, to respond to any changes in the needs of communities for greater flexibility in terms of the time limit in which the approval of a member of the community um, must be dated. And this amendment gives ministers the power to amend the time limit should it be considered in the future that this six-month qualifying uh, timescale is a barrier to communities exercising the right to buy or is causing difficulty to communities when demonstrating uh, support for applications to register an interest in land. So I would ask that the committee support Amendment 29. Sarah Boyack. You know, I suppose I just want to clarify the point um, on the record that you see the potential regulation as expanding the six-month period and increasing it and that you don't see this as being used to decrease the time. Um, and you know, I think uh, very much keen to see this explored so that because um, a regulation would have to take some time to come through Parliament. It obviously does give more flexibility and it lets you change or subsequent ministers change it in the future. But just to be clear, it would be about increasing the opportunities for communities by increasing that time and not reducing it. Yeah, we don't intend to reduce the time scale on that at all. OK. Um, Mike Russell, uh, to wind up, I'll no. press or withdraw? I'll withdraw. Uh, Mike Russell is seeking to withdraw the amendment with the agreement of the committee. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? Nobody has uh, uh, objected to that, uh, that the amendment is therefore withdrawn. So uh, we move on now to call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 48. The Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you, we are agreed. The question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Move to group five. <coughs> Minor amendments in relation to parts two and three of the 2003 Act, including procedure for certain regulations. I call the amendment 30, in the name of the Minister, group with amendments 38, 39, 41 and 43. Minister to move amendment 30 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, convener, this group of amendments are minor amendments which ensure consistency of wording across the bill and they provide that the long title of the bill includes part three of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 in line with the inclusion of proposed changes to that part of the 2003 Act. Amendment 30 is a minor 
drafting amendment to the wording of section 31.1 of the bill, purely for the purposes of consistency with sections 28.1 and 29.1 of the bill. The wording is changed from in accordance with this section to as follows. Amendment 38, this amendment is to ensure consistency of wording across the bill. This is a technical amendment which does not have a substantive effect. The amendment simply changes the words of paragraph 2.1 of Schedule 4 to the bill so that it provides that the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 is amended to as follows rather than in accordance with this paragraph. Amendment 39. Uh, section 37.4a of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 refers to land in which a community interest is sought. Amendment 39 is a technical amendment that will amend this wording to refer to land in which a community is sought to be registered. This wording is consistent with other provisions in the 2003 Act. Amendment 41 reinserts the provision that the validity of anything done under Part 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 will not be affected by any failure of the Lands Tribunal to comply with these time limits. Amendment 43, the long title of the bill, currently refers to the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, but only to Part 2 of that Act, which relates to the community right to buy. This is because at the time of the bill's introduction, no amendments to Part 3 of the 2003 Act were proposed, and this amendment changes the long title of the bill to take account of the proposed amendments to part three of the 2003 Act that have been lodged at stage two. So I invite the committee to support these amendments and I move amendment 30. Are there any other members who wish to speak on this? Minister to wind up? No wind up? Okay. Uh, the question is that amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, we move to Group 6, Late Applications for Registration under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. We call Amendment uh, 31 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendments 50, 49 and 51. Minister to move Amendment 31 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, convener, the Bill as introduced, amended <coughs> the late application process for the community right to buy in Part 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. Those amendments to Part 2 of the 2003 Act will require a community body to show that relevant work or relevant steps were carried out by a person, although not necessarily the community body, before the land was put up for sale. Now, this is in place of the current provisions, which require a community body to show that it has good reasons for submitting a late application. So we propose uh, Amendment 31 in order to make these changes to the late application process more flexible for communities. This is because there could sometimes be circumstances where, for example, land has been on sale for a period of time prior to a need being identified by the community. And this would currently result in the community now wishing to purchase the land being unable to do so because it cannot show that a person took relevant steps or carried out relevant work before the land was marketed for sale. And it may be that there is no other land in the area which would be suitable for uh, their purposes and they could therefore be you know, a very good reason why the application should be approved even though the relevant work or steps uh, have not been um, carried out. So Amendment 31 seeks to insert provisions to the effect that ministers may approve a late application if it can be shown that there are good reasons why relevant work or relevant steps were not undertaken to submit an application before the land was put up for sale. And in addition, if it can be shown that there are good reasons that the late application should succeed, notwithstanding that no such relevant steps or work uh, were undertaken. For an application to succeed under the provision proposed by Amendment 31, ministers would still have to be satisfied that the level of support within the community for the registration is significantly greater than that which the minister would have considered sufficient in a timely uh, application, and that there are factors which the minister considers to be strongly uh, indicative that it is in the public interest to register the community interest. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the various people who have to uh, move. Well, first of all, can you move your Amendment 31? Uh, I move Amendment 31. Yeah, thank you. Mike Russell to speak to Amendment 50 and other amendments in the group. 
Yes, I, I think the uh, concerns that were expressed by Dave Thompson, whose amendment these are, have been uh, in the greatest part rectified, particularly by the amendment that the Minister has just moved. And I think it is very important that there has been a recognition that in the, the registration process, being refused as a result of late registration is a very frustrating thing for communities, and very often it is seen as a technical barrier to success rather than an indication of, of, of whether or not the... Um, uh, application uh, was one that was worthy of, of being fulfilled. Everything should be done to make sure that those technical barriers are reduced as far as possible. And I think in particular in terms of uh, uh, Amendment 51 here, uh, what the Minister has proposed does more or less exactly what is proposed in Amendment 51, which is to say that there are, whilst there, the, the work should be shown, if there are circumstances, for example, if the piece of land came on the market quite unexpectedly, um, there are circumstances in which the Minister can uh, take a step backwards and say we accept that they, whilst the community cannot show that the work has been done, there are reasons why that work hasn't been done. And again, it ties in entirely with the principle of flexibility within this legislation so that communities do not find themselves disadvantaged or unable to move forward because of legislation which is unduly prescriptive. So in those circumstances, um, I will withdraw the amendments. Well, we'll come to that yeah. in a while. Alec Ferguson, speak to Amendment 49. Um, thank you. And other amendments in. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I, I will, if I may, just refer to my own amendment. I'm sorry the Minister chose, uh, uh, didn't, didn't talk about it, but I hope she will in summing up. Um, because just, uh, I, I'm sure most people would agree that a late application process is not ideal, but I absolutely accept that um, there, there are circumstances which require it and that it needs to be part of the process. Um, and just as... Um, there needs to be flexibility within that process. I, my amendment is designed to introduce a degree of balance uh, into the equation by recognising that a landowner uh, should not be unduly disadvantaged, and I stress that word unduly, by the late application process under, certain cir under two circumstances. Firstly, if they have previously offered to sell the asset to the community, and secondly, or if they've entered into discussions with the community regarding the sale of the asset, but, the, uh, uh, but subsequently the community has shown no further interest and, and withdrawn from the, 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 um, the discussions. Um, and in a way it is to prevent, and I'm not saying this would be a, 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 a common uh, thing by any means, but it would, it would prevent the use of the late application process to somehow impede or, or prevent the sale uh, uh, by the landowner for whatever reason. Now, I, I was interested... Um, in the reaction of Community Land Scotland to this um, amendment um, because they are not against this in principle at all and indeed believe it would help the proactive process uh, for communities purchasing assets. Um, and, and I think that's a very helpful comment. What I do accept in Community Land Scotland's um, uh, email that was sent round yesterday is that um, the, 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 it, this would make more sense if there was a timescale attached to it, and I, I can understand that. Now, w what I would like to explore with the Minister, uh, and if she could comment on this on summing up, is whether she agrees to the principle, to the principle of the amendment I've put forward, as Community Land Scotland seems to be, um, whether she would consider bringing forward an amendment of this nature at stage three, um, and if not, then I would, uh, I would probably withdraw this amendment in order to bring back uh, a similar amendment at stage three, bearing in mind the, the, um, the critique of, of Community Land Scotland. But I would very much like to know the Minister's um, views on this amendment when she sums up. That, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. And following on from the um, comments on... Um, the Amendment 49 by um, Alex Ferguson. I would just like to highlight um, from um, the same uh, correspondence from uh, Community Land Scotland yesterday that they did highlight that changing the prior to an offer made within a period of, say, a year to any sub, um, subsequent ap application um, would possibly help and also um, making it clear to provide that the offer would be no greater than what an independent valuer, uh, valuation as per other parts of the Act, that that would take it in line with other parts of the Act would be helpful. 
um, and also providing ministers um, with, uh, with the flexibility to consider any case made by the community regarding any unreasonable conditions on any offer um, or other factors which, in the opinion of the minister, made refusal of the offer by the community a reasonable action. And uh, so I wanted to highlight those points because going forward um, we, we hope to reach a, a conclusion on this either at this stage or at stage three. Thank you. No further comments. Minister, to wind up. Uh, what I would say in relation to the amendment um, 49 is that you know, I do agree with the concerns behind um, this amendment and that community bodies um, should seek to agree to purchase land in preference to using the community um, right to buy where this is an option. You know, any test along the lines suggested uh, in this amendment would obviously need to take into account factors such as the price and terms the land was offered on and the reasons for rejecting the offer or not completing uh, the purchase. So I'm very happy to look at developing um, these factors, uh, working uh, with Mr Ferguson um, to ensure that it is fair to all parties and I would propose lodging a more detailed amendment at stage three. Thank you. Um, we move to the question, is that amendment 31 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, we call amendment 50 in the name of Dave Thompson, already debated with amendment 31. Mike Russell to move or not move? I will not move. Thank you. Does any other member wish to move this? No other member wishes to move this. So we confirm that it is not moved. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, Amendment 49, in the name of Alec Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 31, Alec Ferguson to move or not move? I think given the comments of the Minister in summing up, uh, Convener, I'm happy to withdraw that amendment with the permission of the Committee. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to move that amendment? No. Uh, uh, Alec Ferguson seeking to withdraw the amendment. Uh, so no other member has uh, stated whether they wish to, to move this now. Sorry, Alex hasn't moved it, so technically oh, I'm sorry. We can't can you please it. move it? Um, before I withdraw it, uh, convener, <laughs> I, I wonder if I'd be allowed to move it. <laughs> yes. And I apologise for not doing so early. <laughs> not at all. Thank you very much. Uh, so Alec Ferguson has withdrawn this amendment. No other member has uh, sought to uh, do so. It is not moved. No, it's moved. So um, if Alex wishes to withdraw it. You want to read this out here? Yeah. So, uh, Alex, seeking to withdraw the amendment with the agreement of the committee, does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. Thank you. So now we move to... Uh, 51. Amendment 51. In the name of Dave Thompson, already debated with Amendment 31, Mike Russell to move or not move? Not. Does any other member wish to move Does this? any other member wish to move this? No other member wishes to move this. Uh, therefore, it is, so it's, not it's not moved. Uh, the question is that uh, section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. The question is that sections 32 and 33 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Group 7 we come to now, duration and renewal of registration under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Dave Thompson, Group with Amendments 52, 53 and 55. Mike Russell to move uh, Amendment 44 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Again, uh, uh, convener, this is an issue of flexibility. Uh, registration is a complex process. I, I appreciate that it's being made simpler under this bill, and I think communities will find it easier to do. But I know communities do find re-registration, which is necessary in certain circumstances, to be onerous. And the question is, how can the issue of re-registration be better tackled uh, by this bill? And there are two proposals in here. I, again, I think the Minister has moved a considerable distance uh, in amendment to make sure these are addressed, but I just want to make the point. 
the first of these amendments uh, would have doubled the period for which registration lasts, in other words, from five years to ten years. This was recommended by the Land Reform Review Group in the report in 2014, and therefore I think at least there should be some thinking as to why the Land Reform Review Group would say this and whether this is something that they, uh, should be supported. In the renewal of registration, the, the question here is, if nothing, and things do change in communities clearly over a period of time, but if nothing material has changed in these circumstances, then going through the process of re-registration is a difficult one to do. So the application for re-registration, at the very least, requires to be as simple as possible. And it should really simply pick up those circumstances in which things have changed. It is, if it were to be done you know, electronically, it would simply compare uh, what was applied for last time and what the conditions are pertaining and only change those things which uh, have changed. So I think both of these seek commitments from uh, the Minister uh, to make sure that there is a simplicity in the process, that there is a flexibility in the process, and that re-registration where it is necessary is something that co communities can come to without considerable trepidation and knowing that the likelihood and the default position is that they will succeed in re-registration, which is essentially the purpose. Oh, sorry, I move the yeah. amendments. Thank you. I want to speak um, in support of the objectives of these amendments. Um, I think it is, as Mike Russell has said, about making it straightforward and easy for communities where there hasn't really been a change. Um, rather than putting them through an onerous re-registration process to make it as simple as possible. So I think on the record it would be good to get um, the Minister's views on that matter. And the second amendment, number 52, um, I thought was quite an interesting one, to make sure that the community knew that they were in, within 12 months of their registration expiring. I think that's a very useful prompt. And again, I'd be very keen to hear what the Minister has to say on that issue. Um, I think that if this is about making it straightforward for communities and transparent, um, I think be very keen to hear on the record how the Minister thinks um, the application of the legislation could be made to ensure that communities are not put off by a bu bureaucratic hurdle um, just because somebody um, didn't notice it. The secretary of the group, for example, might be away for a few months. And it's the kind of um, trigger mechanism I think would be very helpful to make sure that this legislation is fit for purpose. To comment just now, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of Amendment uh, 44, and I will uh, put on the record I found the comments from uh, both Mr Russell and uh, Musida Boyack uh, very helpful. Um, but under the existing provisions of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, a community is required to re-register their interest in the land every um, five years. And obviously, Amendment 44, it seeks to extend the time period for which a registration of interest um, lasts from the current five years to ten years. And the amendment is intended to reduce the burden on communities who feel that the re-registration process is an onerous task. However, this would no longer provide indication of the community's current support for the acquisition, but it could also be the case that ministers would be unaware of other important changes to the circumstances that justified the original registration uh, of interest. And that's why I would propose to retain the current five-year period and uh, would ask for Mr Russell to withdraw his amendment um, 44 for the reasons I'm going to set out in the other amendments. In terms of Amendment 52, um, which will require the Register of Scotland's Keeper to notify the community body 12 months before their registered interest in the land uh, will expire. Um, I know this is intended to provide adequate notice to the community body of the impending lapse of their registered interest in the land in order to provide the body with sufficient time to prepare their application for uh, re-registration. Under Section 36 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, the register of community interests must include the name and address of the company that is the community body that registered the interest. However, we do not consider it appropriate to place the burden on the keeper as the appropriate person to notify the community body of the time limit for expiry of the registered interest. We believe that it would be more appropriate for this matter to fall to ministers because the data held on the register of community interests is owned by ministers and held by the keeper on behalf of ministers. So I appreciate the concerns behind the amendment and to address these, I propose that the Scottish Government instead lodges an amendment at stage three. The proposed amendment uh, will require ministers to contact the community body and notify the body of the expiry 
of their registered interest in the land 12 months before the registered interest is due to expire. Consideration will need to be given as to whether community bodies should be required to provide ministers with up-to-date contact details so that the ministers can notify the appropriate person. As a matter of courtesy, ministers currently contact the community body as the five-year registration period nears expiry in order to notify the community body that they will be required to submit uh, the re-registration if they wish the registration of interest uh, in the land to continue. So I would like to uh, ask Mr Russell to withdraw his amendment uh, 52 and the Scottish Government will bring forward an alternative amendment at stage 3. In terms of amendment 53, uh, obviously, that's seeking to introduce a presumption in favour of a community body's re-registration if there have been no material change in circumstances since the first registration of the interest. Uh, at the moment, a community body may re-register at any point from six months before their registration expires. But the community right to buy team within the Scottish Government as part of their work processes um, send the community body a reminder one year before the expiry date, which gives a community six months in which to collect the information required for re-registration. So the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 allows ministers to set out a separate application form for the re-registration process and set out what information must be provided on that form. We have already undertaken to provide a separate application form for re-registration and in doing so we can simplify the form and introduce a form whereby the community body can confirm where there have been no changes to the original application as well as detail those aspects that might have changed. I mean, we would still need the community body to demonstrate that they have a sufficient level of community support for the continued registration, even if the plans that the community body have for the land haven't changed. And therefore, the community body must demonstrate this continued support each time they make an application to re-register the interest. So in essence, uh, where there have been no material changes to the information provided in the original application form, then the re-registration application form will require very little information other than the evidence of the continued support of the community. The main difference between the changes that we are proposing to the application form and Amendment 53 is that Amendment 53 contains a presumption in favour of registration where there have been no material changes in circumstances. The amendment also seeks to give ministers the power to set out the form and procedure for re-registration as well as matters to which they must be satisfied to allow the re-registration and factors to which they must have regard when deciding whether there has been a material change of circumstances. So this amendment would mean that it would be for ministers um, to consider whether there had been a material change in circumstances rather than make a fresh assessment of whether the test for registration in Section 38 of the 2003 Act had uh, been met. These tests in Section 38 include ministers considering whether re-registration re was still in the public interest and whether there was still uh, community support for registering an interest. So the Scottish Government plans to simplify that re-registration process and obviously I am um, very sympathetic to the issue of re-registration but by way of a separate application form that achieves the aim of making it less onerous on community bodies to re-register the community interest and in in addition, they would also ensure there is still community support for the plan and that they remain in the public interest and that the process is open and transparent. So I want to reassure the committee of my commitment to ensure that this process is as open and transparent and simplified and as straightforward as we can possibly um, make it. So as a result, uh, I would ask um, Mr Russell to withdraw uh, his Amendment 53. So Mike Russell to wind up and press or withdraw. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for her positive comments. I think in terms of, uh, of Amendment 52, it is quite clear that the, um, the point she makes is a, is a valid and germane one, and an amendment coming forward from the Government to address that point will be very welcome. Uh, could I just ask for one small bit of clarification from the Minister? In terms of the, uh, the, the, the application form, uh, will the, that form or what is to be in that form be defined in guidance to the Bill, or, or what other way will that be defined? I think I'm certainly not questioning the bona fides that you're giving. I just want to know where we will find that out. No, 
reason why it can't be in the guidance. Okay. I think if there was an assurance that the form would be in guidance to the bill, I think the principles for which you're giving are, are entirely correct. And I do accept the point that uh, a, a minister, the ministerial role needs to be clarified. That convener leaves us with um, Amendment 44. Uh, the Land Reform Group's recommendation was for 10 years. And a, I think you know, there, is a, there is a strong body of opinion that believes that a five-year period is too short. Uh, whilst, with the permission of the committee, when we come to it, I won't press this, I would ask the Minister to consider, as she moves towards stage three, whether that advice in the Land Reform Group is something that does require further thinking. Because I do think uh, you know, Mr Thompson certainly will want to consider, I'm sure, in terms of amendment at stage three, whether he should continue to press the issue. Possibly with the, uh, some sort of procedure after five years to, in terms of re-registration or, or confirming details. But I think a longer period of time for a community is something that may be desirable and has been seen as such by others. And I'm happy to do so, convener, to have another Thank look you. at that amendment. Okay. So Mike Russell to press or withdraw? With the permission of the committee, I would withdraw 44. Mike Russell seeking to withdraw the amendment with the agreement of the committee. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No member objects, so therefore the amendment is therefore withdrawn. Uh, we call uh, amendment 52 in the name of Dave Thompson, already debated with amendment 44. Mike Russell to move or not move? With the permission of the committee, not move. Uh, uh, the committee uh, not moved. Does any other member wish to move that in his case? Nobody does, so therefore it's not moved. And uh, I call Amendment 53 in the name of Dave Thompson, already debated with Amendment 44. Mike Russell to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Uh, does uh, Mike Russell wishes to withdraw that amendment? Does any other member wish to uh, propose the amendment? No other member does, therefore it's not moved. Uh, in which case the question is that Amendment... Uh, uh, sorry, that the sections 34 to 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We move to Group 8. Appeals to lands tribunals as respects valuations of land under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. Call Amendment 32 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendment 42. Minister to move Amendment 32. Speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, Minister. Uh, convener, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 requires that the Lands Tribunal uh, must give reasons in writing for its decision on an appeal as to the valuation of the land within four weeks of the hearing of the appeal. The bill as introduced removed this four-week time limit. However, I am proposing reinserting the time limit for the Lands Tribunal to issue written reasons for its decisions, but extending the four-week time limit to eight weeks after the hearing of the appeal. Now, this is proposed in order to provide the Lands Tribunal with greater flexibility when scheduling its cases. In addition to inserting an eight-week time limit, this amendment also provides an option for the Lands Tribunal if it considers that it is not reasonable to issue a written statement of reasons within that eight-week time limit to notify the parties of, to the appeal of a new date by which it will issue its written reasons. Now, I'm proposing this amendment in order to provide greater flexibility for the Lands Tribunal when scheduling their workload, whilst at the same time ensuring that parties to the appeal have a degree of certainty as to when they will receive the written statement of reasons. Now, this amendment aligns Part 2 with the proposed amendments to Part 3 and the proposed Part 3A of the 2003 Act. Amendment 42 is linked to Amendment 32, currently Schedule 5 to the Bill, removes the requirement in Section 62 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 for the Lands Tribunal to decide an appeal and issue a written statement of reasons within four weeks of the hearing of an appeal under Section 62. Schedule 5 to the Bill also removes Section 62.8 of the 2003 Act, which provides that a failure by the Lands Tribunal to comply with this time limit doesn't affect the validity of anything done under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. So Amendment 32 inserts the eight-week time limit within which the Lands Tribunal must issue a written statement of reasons. The amendment also allows the Land Tribunal to, where it considers that it's not reasonable to issue a written statement within eight weeks, notify the parties to the appeal of the date by which it will issue its written statement. 
Amendment 42 removes the repeal of Section 22.8 of the 2003 Act and so provides that failure by the Lands Tribunal to comply with the time limit in Amendment 32 will not affect the validity of anything done under Part 2 of the 2003 Act. Amendments 32 and 42 are intended purely to ease the burden on the Lands Tribunal and gives it more flexibility when scheduling its caseload. Now, although there are no consequences should the Lands Tribunal be unable to meet the time limit, I know that stakeholders were very clear in the need to provide a date by which the Lands Tribunal is expected to provide its written decision in order to give an element of certainty to all parties to the application. So I would invite the Committee to support these amendments and I move Amendment 32. Are there any members who wish to contribute? Minister to Mike Russell. It's admirable and could be supplied in all legal circumstances, but we should remember, and I think it's important the committee does know, Derek Flynn's view in evidence, that in actual fact they, there is no sanction on the land court for this. And indeed, I can imagine, can't imagine a, um, um, those in charge of the land court or any other court accepting such a sanction. So whilst it's highly desirable, and I hope and I think the committee would hope, and everybody would hope it would be observed, I don't think it of itself is going to produce the result that we're wishing, which is that crofting cases do not take forever. Minister, to wind up. Um, thank you for giving it. Only just to say around the, uh, the point that's been made by Mr Russell, to say that you know, if, um, if they are late, then it has um, no effect on the application. So just to reassure. Okay. Uh, so the question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Sections 46 and 47 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are. I call Amendment 33 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 18. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. In that case, uh, are we agreed, members? We are agreed uh, to Amendment 33. I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 18. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Uh, we move to Group 9, information to be included in application under Part 3 of the 2003 Act. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister and a group of its own. Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 3. Uh, convener, this amendment relates to the requirements of an application by a crofting community body under Part 3 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. The amendment sets out that the application form must identify the owner of the land, any creditor in a standard security over the land with the right to sell any part of it, and where they are being purchased separately from the land, the tenant of any tenancy of land over which the tenant has an interest, and the person entitled to any sporting interests. It is important that the owner or person entitled to any interest being purchased is identified because of the nature of the legislation. The mechanism of the legislation is such that the owner or person entitled to the interest must be identified in order to transfer the land to the crofting community body. Section 86.4 of the 2003 Act provides for the completion of purchase by the crofting community body by way of the owner of the land or interest transferring title. Section 86.6 provides that if the owner or person entitled to the interest refuses or fails to effect the transfer, the land court may authorise its clerk to execute the deeds on their behalf. It is therefore essential to the process that the owner of the land or person entitled to the interest is identified. Now, the procedure in the 2003 Act is different from other compulsory purchase procedures where if the landowner is unknown or cannot be found, the purchasing authority can declare title by way of a general vesting declaration which is registered in the land register. Now, the amendment also seeks to simplify the mapping requirements for crofting community bodies. Currently, the application form that ministers must prescribe in regulations must include provision that the crofting community are required to identify all rights and interests in the subjects of the application. These are sewers, pipes, lines, water courses or other conduits, fences, dikes, ditches or other boundaries in or on the land that are known to the applicant body or the existence of which they are on reasonable diligent inquiry capable of ascertaining. 
Now, we consider that in some cases it could be particularly difficult for a crofting community body to identify all these rights and interests. So the amendment proposes to simplify this requirement by stating that the crofting community bodies must identify all rights and interests in the subjects of the application that are known to the crofting community body. So we are proposing to remove that requirement to identify the sewers, the pipes, the lines, the watercourses, uh, fences, dikes, dishes or other boundaries. And we propose this amendment because we recognise that the current mapping requirements as being particularly complex and ministers will still set out the required information for the application and regulations, but it will no longer be required to include those interests that I have mentioned as being considered particularly difficult to identify. And this amendment also amends the provisions relating to the public notice requirements in section 7311 of the 2003 Act. Currently, public notice of the application must be given by advertisement in such newspapers circulating in the area where the subjects of the application are situated, as ministers think appropriate, and in the Edinburgh Gazette. The amendment removes these requirements and replaces them with the power for ministers to set out in regulations what the requirements for public notice will be. And I would ask the committee to support these amendments and I move Amendment 3. Thank you, Minister. Uh, does any member wish to comment? I think I should say that, uh, yes. Uh, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Convener. I just had a couple of comments um, on the Amendment 3. Just very much welcome that. I think it makes it more straightforward and I think makes the legislation more likely to be able to be used as intended. Um, we're on Section f uh, Amendment 5 as well, aren't we, at the moment? Or is that a separate one? No. Hold off. Thank you. OK. Indeed, I think many people in the crofting communities through the experience of uh, various buyouts are very much in favour of uh, the proposal that you've made. So, Minister, to wind up now? I'm fine. No, indeed. So the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Group 10, Criteria for Ministerial Consent under Part 3 of the 2003 Act. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister and a group of its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 4. Uh Section 74 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 sets out the criteria of which ministers must be satisfied before approving an application by a crofting community body to compulsorily purchase eligible croft land. <sighs> Amendment 4 seeks to add to the conditions set out in Section 74.1 of the Act so that in order to consent to an application under Part 3, ministers must be satisfied that the owner, tenant, person entitled to sporting interests or creditor in a standard security in relation to that land or interests are correctly identified in the application supported by, sorry, submitted by the crofting community body. And this amendment ensures that all relevant parties are accurately identified during the application process, keeping it in line with Amendment 3. This will ensure that all parties to the application are fully involved in the process and will be given the opportunity to comment on the application. This will ensure that ministers will have received all available evidence on which to make a decision on the crofting community right to buy application. As with Amendment 3, it is important that the owner of any interest being purchased is identified because of the nature of the legislation. The mechanism of the legislation is such that the owner must be identified in order to transfer the land to the crofting community body. So section 86.4 of the 2003 Act provides for the completion of purchase by the crofting community body by way of the owner of the land or interest transferring title. Section 86.6 provides that if the owner or person entitled to the interest refuses or fails to effect the transfer, that the land court may authorise its clerk to execute the deeds on their behalf. So it's therefore essential to the process that the owner of the land or person entitled to the interest is identified. And that is different from other compulsory purchase legislation where the purchasing authority can register a general vesting declaration in the land register to declare that it has title to the land. So I would invite the committee to support this amendment and I move amendment four. Thank you. Do any members wish to comment? No members wish to comment. Minister to wind up? No. Uh, the question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, 
Group 11, ballots under Part 3 of the 2003 Act, call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister and a group of its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 5. Uh, convener, I propose uh, Amendment 5 to clarify that the Crofton community body is required to meet the expense of conducting the ballot. However, the amendment also gives ministers the power to make regulations setting out circumstances in which a Crofton community body can seek to recover the cost of running the ballot from the Scottish ministers in certain circumstances. Now, the reason that we do not propose to bring forward an amendment to the effect that ministers will pay for the cost of all ballots carried out under the Crofton community body right to buy provisions is because, unlike in the procedure for the community right to buy under Part 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, the ballot is the first indication of whether or not there is community support for the application in Part 2. By the time the ballot takes place, the community body must already have indicated community support for the registration of their interest in the land. There is also the issue of the timing of the ballot. In Part 2 of the 2003 Act, it takes place after a community's application to register an interest has been approved. In Part 3, it takes place before the application is received by the Scottish Government. This means that in Part 3, ministers would not have had the opportunity to assess the application in any way before agreeing to pay for the ballot. So Amendment 5 also seeks to give ministers the power to request further relevant information as they see fit from the Crofting community body in relation to the ballot, including information relating to any consultation with those eligible to vote in the ballot. And this information uh, will assist ministers with their decision making in relation to the Crofting community body's right to buy application. And these amendments are in line with the proposed part 3A of the Act. And I would urge the committee to support this amendment and I move Amendment 5. Thank you. Does any member wish to comment? Sarah Boya. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. It's uh, just really to dig into why um, a, the community, the Crofting community, has to pay for the ballot. I take the point that the legislation is slightly different, but I'm wondering why you haven't changed the legislation to make it the same, um, to make it more straightforward. And could you clarify what the circumstances would be where the body could seek reimbursement? Would that, for example, be where there's a vote in favour of the proposal? Um, but not against. Just wondering, just so that people's expectations are absolutely clear when the legislation is put through. The ballot is done before the application, so somebody um, has to see that um, application before um, going forward. But in terms of the um, circumstances, yes. want to add anything? On that? No, sorry, it's can. No, we can't. Can. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Advise the minister. <laughs> sorry, it's been a long morning. Sorry. I think, given the fact, you know, if, if there is, you know, community support is is there um, in terms of the uh, the community right to buy, then that's obviously, you know, a very good reason, therefore, for the the government to actually um, pay for that ballot. Okay. Just wanted that on the record. Thank you very much. Uh, if that's so, then the question is that Amendment Five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We move to uh, Group 12, application by more than one crofting community body. Uh, I call Amendment 6, in the name of the Minister and a group of its own. Minister to move and speak to Amendment 6. Uh, convener, when more than one crofting community body applies to purchase the same land uh, or interest, only one application can proceed and all others are extinguished. So I'm proposing Amendment 6 to ensure that when more than one crofting community buy applies to buy the same land or interest and an application is extinguished, that all persons invited to give views on the applications are notified that an application is extinguished. This is in line with the provisions of the proposed new Part 3A of the 2003 Act, and I'd ask the committee to support this amendment, and I move Amendment 6. Thank you. Any members wish to comment? Nobody wishes to comment. Uh, the question is, Amendment 6 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, group 13, references to the Land Court under Part 3 of the 2003 Act, etc. 
Call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendment 10. Minister to speak to Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, convener, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 specifies what persons connected to a Crofton community right to buy application may refer a question to the Land Court before a decision is made on the application. Currently, Section 81 of the 2003 Act lists certain persons who have a right to refer a question to the Land Court at any time before ministers reach a decision on an application. Currently, the persons who have the right to refer are ministers, any person who is a member of the Crofton community, any person who has an interest in the land or sporting interests which are the subjects of the application giving rise to a right which is legally enforceable by that person. With the subject of the application is a tenant's interest, any person who has an interest in the lease being an interest giving rise to a right which is legally enforceable by that person or any person who is invited to send views to ministers on the application. Now, the proposed amendment extends the list of persons who have a right to refer a question to the Land Court before ministers reach a decision on an application to include the owner of the land, which is a subject of the application, and the person entitled to any sporting interests which are subjects of that application. So I propose Amendment 7 because it extends uh, the list of persons who may refer a question to the Land Court and therefore ensures that all relevant parties are given the opportunity to submit a question to the Land Court. Uh, Amendment 10, uh, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 currently requires the Land Court must give reasons in writing for its decision on an appeal within four weeks of the hearing of the appeal. So what we are proposing is to extend the four-week time limit for the Land Court's decision to eight weeks in order to provide the Land Court with greater flexibility when scheduling its cases. So in addition to extending the time limit to eight weeks, this amendment also provides an option for the Land Court if it considers that it's not reasonable to issue a written statement of reasons within that eight-week time limit to notify the parties to the appeal of a new date by which it will issue its written reasons. So I'm proposing that amendment in order to provide greater flexibility for the Land Court when scheduling their workload, whilst at the same time ensuring that parties to the appeal have a degree of certainty as to when they will receive the written statement of reasons. So this proposal aligns Part 3 with proposed amendments to Part 2 and the proposed Part 3A of the 2003 Act. And I would invite the committee to support this amendment and I move Amendment 7. Does any member wish to uh, comment? Well, I'd just like to make two comments. One, uh, I just wonder if there's enough capacity in the Land Court uh, and I wonder whether the uh, processes of the Land Court, these cases, are simplified in any way so as to avoid the time that it takes to reply. Minister, to wind up and uh, comment. I think we're very happy to look into that in terms of the capacity around the land court. We'd appreciate if you were in touch with us about yeah, that. Yeah, I'm very happy to write formally to the committee. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, group 14, valuations under part 3 of the 2003 Act, call Amendment 8, the name of the Minister and a group of its own Minister to move and speak to the amendment. Uh, convener, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 sets out in section 88 the procedure for the assessment of the value of the Croft land or interests being purchased. They currently require the valuer to invite the owner of the land, tenant or person entitled to the sporting interests and the crofting community body to make representations in writing about the value of the land. So I propose in this amendment which would allow for counter-representations to be made on comments made relating to the valuation of the land and to allow the valuer adequate time to take these into account. So the proposed amendment extends the time limit for notification uh, by the valuer of the determination from six weeks to eight weeks. It seeks to allow counter-representations to be made by either the owner of the land, the tenant or the person entitled to sporting interests in response to representations made by the Crofton Community Body. It also seeks to allow counter-representations to be made by the Crofton Community Body in response to representations made by either the owner of the land, the tenant or the person entitled to sporting interests. And the effect of this amendment will be to ensure that the valuer takes account of all the parties' views to the application and has the time to do so. 
So these amendments seek to assist the valuer in reaching a fair assessment of the value of the land or interest, which is a subject of the crofting community body's right to buy application. And the proposed amendment aligns the provisions of Part 3 with the proposed provisions of to Part 2 and the proposed Part 3A of the 2003 Act. And I would ask the committee to support this amendment. And I move Amendment 8. Thank you. Uh, does any member wish to comment? No member does. Minister, no need to wind up then. No. Indeed, the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, group 15, Part 3 of the 2003 Act, Compensation for Certain Losses. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister and a group of its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 9. Uh, convener, this proposed amendment replaces the requirement under Section 89.4 with the power of ministers to make an order to specify the amounts payable by the crofting community body in respect of loss or expense incurred, the amounts payable by other persons in respect of loss or expense incurred, and the person including persons other than the crofting community body who is liable to pay those amounts and the procedure under which claims for compensation are to be made. This proposed amendment aligns Part 3 with provisions in the proposed Part 3A of the Act, and I'd invite the committee to support this amendment and I move Amendment 9. Thank you. Uh, any member wish to comment? If not, then the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 10. The name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 7. Minister to move formally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, group 16, meaning of a creditor and standard security with the right to sell in Part 3 of the 2003 Act. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister and a group of its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 11. Uh, convener, uh, this amendment inserts a meaning of the expression creditor in standard security with a right to sell for the purposes of the crofting community right to buy provisions in part three of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. Just to ensure that there is clarity as to the definition of the term, I would ask the committee to support this amendment and I move Amendment 11. Thank you. Any member wish to comment? Nobody does. Minister, you've wound up, I guess. Uh, the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, this ends stage two consideration of the bill for today, although I think some members were wanting the chance to go on now that their dander is up. But I'm restraining them <laughs> because we have to have another session next week. Uh, all the remaining amendments for consideration by this committee should be lodged by 12 noon this Friday with the clerks to the legislation team. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, you and your officials, a uh, bit of a marathon, but uh, we've succeeded in getting thus far. Thank you very much. At its next meeting, the committee will continue the consideration of stage two of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill and consider a petition PE 1547 on conserving Scottish wild salmon. So it's a Groundhog Day next week. Then. <laughs> I now close the meeting.